My name is Uliana Feast, and I'm chairing the next session. And I don't think that the speaker of the session will actually need any introduction, um, but I will say a few words anyway. Um, Professor Martin Cahier from the University of Bielefeld um, is next to Paul Heuning and Hühner Schurli, one of the most well-known, internationally renowned philosophers of science from Germany. Um, he's published widely on a broad range of topics from early modern philosophy of science or philosophy of our, or early modern science to more recent topics um, that include the epistemology of applied research. He's also the recipient of multiple awards and honors such as the prestigious Leibniz Prize. Um, I also did a little bit of research on my own um, regarding the question how he and Paul um, met each other and I found out that we already heard that Paul was in Pittsburgh in um, 1988 and apparently Martin Cahier joined him there in the summer right before Paul was leaving and it turned out they both had infant children and there was some, uh, it, uh, apparently from what I gather, uh, Martin Cahier, no, Paul was very helpful in passing on some essential items that one needs for non-potty trained children. Um, luckily for us, this appears to be how they first bonded, but luckily for us, that's not um, the only way they bonded. And they kept in touch and obviously were colleagues for a while um, over the years. And in his talk today, Martin Cahier is going to engage with Paul's work on systematicity. Welcome. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for this introduction. So I need to... Escape. Escape. That's a good start. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm uh, happy, happy to be here, Paul, and... Uh, uh, one of the one of the great surprises here that that uh, I mean y you look so young, so active, so vigorous that uh, this is simply incredible that you might retire. Unfortunately enough, you don't. Um, so we can we can continue our uh, philosophical discussion, and that's what I that's what I uh, want to do this this afternoon. Um, I will um, um, engage a bit with the. Uh, most recent um, a, a approaches of yours to uh, the nature of science and the systematicity of science, um, and with the uh, remarkable uh, book that you published uh, recently, a study on, on how to characterize the, the scientific enterprise. And in principle, there seem to be two, two ways how this, how this can be uh, achieved. One, by appealing to the products of, of scientific research, that is, to the, to the nature of, of scientific knowledge, and, and another way, um, by addressing the methods for producing scientific knowledge. And Paul pursues both avenues in his ninefold way uh, of characterizing science. Paul includes epistemic connectedness and, and completeness as important distinctions of scientific knowledge and in the items defense of knowledge claim, claims and the critical discourse in the scientific community as, as chief distinctions of the scientific way of gaining uh, knowledge. So let me first give a Reader's Digest um, version of Powell's approach. Scientific knowledge differs from other kinds of knowledge such as everyday knowledge by being more systematic. As a result, characterizing science always means to compare scientific achievements uh, to other sorts of knowledge claims in, in the same domain. For instance, scientific psychology is considered in relation to or everyday modes of making sense of other person's behavior. 
Systematicity, as Powell uses uh, the notion, is not an overly systematic concept. It has to do uh, with, with an orderly and methodical approach and is contrasted with randomness and arbitrariness. And this concept ramifies into, into nine dimensions uh, in, in which scientific knowledge can be more systematic than, than other kinds of knowledge. And these dimensions include description, explanation, prediction, defense of knowledge claims, uh, critical discourse, epistemic connectedness, and some more. So given the, the general characterization of the notion everything depends on making it more tangible for specific contexts, and among Paul's chief claims is that there is not one distinguished element that could serve to characterize science. Rather, the nature of the scientific enterprise can only be captured by appeal to a multitude of characteristics that exhibit a relation of family resemblance. Wittgenstein's notion of family resemblance suggests that some groups of entities are not adequately described by necessary and sufficient properties, but rather by a framework of overlapping similarities. In the family, some members agree in the shape of their nose or in the color of their eyes, yet others in their way of walking. So there is no single feature that all family members exhibit. And another Wittgensteinian metaphor is, is the rod that does not owe its stability to one fiber that runs through the whole rod. Rather, there are lots of threads in the rod that overlap and produce the rod's strengths by multiple local connections. Paul develops a, a highly interesting proposal that brings together various intuitions about what scientific knowledge accomplishes. On the one hand, systematicity emphasizes uh, features um, of, of the product of scientific research, and this applies to the capacity of science to give explanations, to arrive at predictions. And I understand the notion of epistemic connectedness. Um, I understand that the notion of epistemic connectedness highlights the coherence of, of the system of knowledge. And Powell does a, a wonderful job in unfolding the, the various ramifications that this vague notion of coherence in, involves. On the other hand, systematicity aims to reflect the importance of the process of scrutiny in, in science. And I understand that the dimensions uh, defense of knowledge claims and critical discourse are supposed to express this commitment. So Paul emphasizes uh, the, the heterogeneous nature of the dimensions and, and stresses their, their family resemblance. There's no single criterion that is completely general. For instance, mathematics fails to make predictions. However, later in his book on systematicity, Powell appears to make a disclaimer by saying that the dimension of the defense of knowledge claims is absolutely indispensable. And these two claims seem to exhibit a certain tension. After all, the latter claim entails that the severity of the test and confirmation procedures in science is a fiber, as it were, that runs through the entire uh, rod of the scientific enterprise. And in my humble opinion, 
Paul is right with the disclaimer. If the relation to experience is not considered central and can be outperformed by purely conceptual relations such as epistemic connectedness, a well-structured but otherwise fancy idea might well surpass a sober, small-scale, descriptive account. Think of medieval theology that seems to be much more systematic uh, with respect to epistemic connectedness and completeness than everyday beliefs about a superior being. Or astrological tenets are much more complete and interconnected than the usual folklore about stars. The trouble is that no convincing attempts were made or all such attempts failed, respectively, to link up such claims with experience. So I grant that the, the missing link to experience diminishes the, the systematicity um, of, of the corresponding accounts. After all, there are no phenomena that are rightly connected to these claims, but Given the family resemblance of the concept of systematicity, I see no ground for ruling out that this admitted deficiency can be compensated by other virtues uh, regarding, say, epistemic connectedness. And I suggest that the failure to deliver on, on the defense dimension is crucial. There should be no option for offsetting such a failure by conceptual virtues. Think of supersymmetry that is going down the drain presently because of empirical failure and in spite of its tremendous um, empirical advantages. Powell might want to treat theology and astrology as pseudosciences and drill them out because they are inferior to a further progressive alternative. But I am not sure whether we need an alternative theory to reject such an unsupported claim. And regarding medieval theology and astrology, I don't see any more progressive alternative. As a result, I think that the key to distinguishing the scientific enterprise is critical examination, but this entails that there are more central and less central features of systematicity. Lack of prediction does not hurt, but lack of defense does. And this would provide a means for making systematicity more systematic, namely by setting apart what is essential to science. And this crucial and imperative element is the process of empirical control of knowledge claims. So, uh, empirical tests and the role of epistemic value. In, in what follows, I, I want to fill in some of the interstices. Paul has left open his account, at least to my humble opinion. In, in particular, I aim to flesh out a bit the items number four and five in Paul's ninefold way to uh, reconstructing the scientific enterprise, that is the defense of knowledge claims and, and critical discourse. So this is uh, many, I, I'm, I, this is where I, where I try to uh, fill in the, the interstices. Yeah? I mean, it's a sort of underlaborer. Yeah? Uh, um, so the point, the point I, I try to make in the, in, the, in the first section is that I think that science is chiefly characterized by its process of scrutiny. And when, when science was f formed in its, in its present shape in the in the early 17th century, the demanding standards of, of testing and confirming claims were placed at, at the center. And I wish to elaborate Paul's scheme a bit in, in this direction. 
So let me let me emphasize right at the start that I think Paul is quite right uh, in distinguishing between the two the two branches of this of this process of, um, of empirical uh, empirical test. Some of the relevant procedures can be followed by individual. This is the left hand uh, branch, and uh, some some processes are essentially social. This is the the right hand branch. Uh, so the the social part thrives on the interaction uh, between individuals, and it is framed by, by the structure of the scientific community. And the pivot on the individual part includes methodological standards, namely a collection of epistemic values, values that in their entirety represent the scientific method that Paul thinks has been abandoned. One remark on scope before I begin. Paul's scheme is intended to apply to the sciences and humanities, that is to the, the entire realm of scholarly activities that most of the continental languages denote as Schenza, Nauka, Wissenschaft. And I'm at a loss to make many illuminating observations uh, about the humanities and thus restrict myself to the, to the sciences in the narrower English language understanding of the term. And the, the advantage is, I think, that such a narrow account can be richer in, in content. The, the core standards applied in, in, empirical, in empirical tests are, certainly are empirical adequacy and, and logical consistency, and these two Requirements represent a sort of uh, minimum threshold that all assumptions need exceed if they are to be admitted to the system of knowledge. However, a closer look at processes of examining knowledge claim reveals that these standards are insufficient for singling out satisfactory hypotheses. Scientists go beyond these requirements in adopting assumptions. And this lesson comes out clearly if cases of underdetermination are considered. In such cases, two or more empirically equivalent or approximately equivalent rivals compete for being accepted by the scientific community. And the first observation is that in in most of the cases, one of the competitors is adopted, actually adopted at the expense of the rival. That is, one option is preferred in spite of the fact that both pass the, the minimum requirement of being empirically adequate and, and logically consistent. And this behavior of the scientific community shows that empirical adequacy does not sufficiently capture the performance of, of a theory. That is, additional non-empirical virtues uh, come in, into play. And the reason is that the facts in and by themselves do not determine how they are to be rendered or interpreted. For instance, one way of, of capturing data is to simply itemize the phenomena observed an alternative is to ascend to observational generalization. A third possibility is to subsume such generalizations under higher level theoretical principles. And each of these modes exhibits characteristic virtues and liabilities. Cataloging observations renders the facts with high accuracy and certainty while Summarizing them by observation, by uh, um, summarizing them by observational generalizations, uh, uh, avoids the unwieldiness of this list of items. It yields a more parsimonious account, and invoking theoretical principles provide a more unified and coherent picture of an entire realm of experience. But suffers in general from a reduction in accuracy. Typically, 
descending from the principles to the concrete phenomena demands adjustments by adding more specific hypotheses or introducing correction factors and the like. So the upshot is that experience leaves us with choices in, a, in accounting for, for the phenomenon. This is even more striking when we turn to competing real life accounts that were indistinguishable in empirical respect. Think of the struggle between Ptolemaic geocentrism, Copernican heliocentrism, and Tychonic geoheliocentrism in uh, late 16th century astronomy. And all three accounts uh, yielded the, the planetary motion with roughly the same accuracy. They can be considered empirically equivalent in, in practical respect. And what we observe in the debate is, is the influence of two methodological yardsticks, namely explanatory power and coherence with established background knowledge. Theory with great explanatory power need a minimum of independent principles to account for a broad class of phenomena in an accurate fashion. And Copernican astronomy ex excelled in, in this respect, at least as regards the qualitative features of planetary motion. For instance, the periodic occurrence of so-called retrograde motion and all its observable properties could be accounted for by invoking nothing but the core principles of the Copernican theories, whereas Ptolemy needed additional tailor-made assumption for every single aspect of the phenomenon. However, geocentric um, astronomy outperformed uh, its Copernican rival regarding its coherence with the accepted Aristotelian physics. The Aristotelian account of the origin and nature of the weight of heavy bodies could be, could not be squared persuasively with the assumption that the Earth is revolving around its own axis, a axis and located at a distance from the center of the universe. Copernican theory suffered from its incompatibility with the physics of the period. The quick acceptance of the geoheliocentric account can be attributed to the impact of the very same criteria. The Tychonic compromise system preserved the explanatory achievements of the Copernican approach and remained in agreement with most of the received physics and cosmology. So the upshot is, first, that the scientific community did make a choice between empirically equivalent alternatives, and that second, the criteria operative in this choice were explanatory power and coherence with background knowledge. I skip this example, the conventionality of physical geometry. Uh, the upshot is the same, namely there was a, a non-empirical criterion of the preservation of causality that uh, actually determined uh, the choice. Speaking, speaking more, more generally, under determination problems of this sort can be addressed and in part solved by invoking values called epistemic or cognitive, a designation that I, that I take to emphasize the gain of significant knowledge or the gain of understanding rather than true simpliciter. Thomas Kuhn initiated this approach with catching a list model of assessing scientific theories. And this list of values includes accuracy, consistency, broad scope, simplicity, and, and fruitfulness. And Kuhn's list is by no means exclusive. Helen Longino suggests empirical ad adequacy, novelty, ontological heterogeneity, and others as standards for assessing scientific 
theories. Epistemic values, that is, values that go beyond accuracy or empirical adequacy. Epistemic values are used in assessing how well hypotheses are doing in light of the available evidence. They are used for singling out acceptable hypotheses. Hypotheses need to exhibit certain virtues over and above fitting the phenomenon. Um, such non-empirical values favor certain forms of agreement with the observations over other such forms. The scientific community resorts to such values for making a choice between empirically indistinguishable alternatives. So critical as epistemic values are in the process of uh, confirming and adopting hypotheses, they fail to direct this process unambiguously. And Kuhn was the first to call attention to this insufficiency of epistemic values, which arises from the tension between different such values in the application to concrete cases. And here's an example of this Kuhn under determination, that is the, the room for judgment created by ambiguous, ambivalent epistemic values. Consider the competition between Henrik Lorenz, classical electron theory, and Albert Einstein's special relativity theory around 1910. Lorentz theory had a larger domain of application than Einstein's. It included electrodynamic uh, phenomena that were accounted for by Einstein as well, but also interactions between charges and fields such as what is called the normal Zeeman effect, the split of spectral lines in the magnetic field. These effects were later included uh, into quantum mechanics. Special relativity excelled in explanatory power or simplicity or parsimony, whatever you like to call it, in the sense that a few principles covered a wide range of phenomena. And the reason is that Lorentz assumed certain effects and subsequently introduced mechanisms that prevented the observability of these effects. He needed to invoke a sort of conspiracy of nature who veils her true workings to the gaze of humans. And Einstein did away with both the effects and their compensation so that uh, special relativity outperformed classical electron theory with respect to explanatory power. Yet, combining the two virtues of broad scope and explanatory power leaves us without a clear rank order um, of the two theories. And such underdetermination of judgment is even more striking if a conflicting set of epistemic values is employed. Consider the tension between coherence and progress. One may either appreciate the preservation of what has been achieved as a primary goal or chiefly reward venturing into new ground. For instance, the general relativistic program of geometrizing gravitation involved a rupture with the Newtonian view on gravity and shifted gravity away from other natural forces. Gravitation adopted a unique position as geometrized interaction. And there was a loss of coherence but the gain of empirical adequacy and predictive power. So as a result, different sets of epistemic values suggest different judgments when the merits of particular theories are compared. The point I, I wish to make here is that the process of empirical scrutiny in science involves an appeal to empirical virtues, such as empirical adequacy, and non-empirical virtues, such as the mentioned non-empirical values. Non-empirical values are used 
for assessing the import of the evidence on assumptions and incorporate essential epistemic commitments of the scientific enterprise. It's not just any defense of knowledge claims that counts as scientific, but only the defense by appeal to certain selected standards. Defending the descent of the human race by appeal to sacred texts is no scientific endeavor. Defending climate change by defending climate change denial by conjuring up the negative impact of climate protection measures on the American car industry is no scientific argument. So I emphasize that the, that the set of epistemic values adopted in the scientific community is not unambiguously designated. This set is subject to individual variations, uh, fuzzy boundaries, historical changes. And this fact, I suggest, underlies Powell's claim that no scientific method exists. However, I take it that the collection of epistemic values embodies the scientific method. After all, such values guide the assessment procedures in science and determine what the confirmation relations in science look like. The entirety of partly overlapping, partly conflicting commitments represent that scientific method. Kuhn has rightly emphasized that a set of maxims is worthwhile for guiding behavior even if some of the maxims contradict each other's. Even in such cases, these maxims highlight what the range of plausible standards of evaluations is. And the more general conclusion I wish to draw is that the defense of knowledge claims in science need to be and can be further articulated. Such an elaboration of the commitment to the defense of knowledge claims serves to bring out the particular character of scientific scrutiny. The critical discourse uh, in the scientific community. I applaud Powell's emphasis on the double nature, individual and social, of the defense of knowledge claims. The primary virtue of this distinction is to highlight the importance of social procedures. The interaction between scientists is of critical importance for assessing claims in science. Scientists reciprocally censure their conflicting approaches. The epistemic rationale behind such practices is that all scientists take some assumptions for granted. These beliefs appear self-evident and as a matter of course so that they are frequently not acknowledged as substantive principles in the first place. The trouble with such unnoticed or implicit assumptions is that they go unexamined. They are never subjected to empirical scrutiny. And this means that if one of these seemingly innocuous claims should be mistaken, its falsity is hardly ever recognized. Predicaments of this sort can be overcome by drawing on the critical force of scientific opponents. They will struggle to expose unfounded principles and try their best to poke holes in um, one's cherished uh, theories. And if scientists proceed in a false direction, there is a good chance that they are proven wrong by their more fortunate adversaries. Scientific Controversies are an appropriate instrument for revealing blind spots, one-sided accounts, and unfounded principles. Such deficiencies are best uncovered by taking an alternative position. Robert Merton was the first to analyze science consistently from the angle of the scientific community. The scientific community is the bearer of knowledge since Knowledge is produced 
by the interaction of the community members. Science is not a matter of individual geniuses and their lonely discoveries and conceptual breakthroughs. Rather, the community is essential in examining the validity and appropriateness of alleged findings. Experiments are repeated or more sophisticated endeavors are built on their results. Premises are attacked and criticized. The self-policing of the scientific community is essential for the test and examination processes in science. Scientific claims are subjected to critical scrutiny by other scientists. In a, in a similar vein, the Mertonian value of disinterestedness is to be understood as a social norm. Disinterestedness means that the scientific community does not prefer certain research results over others. And this is an institutional imperative, not a psychological factor. It addresses the community, not individual researchers, who may well be motivated to produce outcome of a certain kind. The disinterestedness of the scientific community as a whole is epitomized by the struggle between antagonistic approaches. The community is divided, and for this reason, does it not express a joint preference as to what the quest at hand should accomplish. The, the social nature of this process of critical examination has been stressed by Longino in the past 20 years. She put forward procedural standards that are assumed to govern scientific scrutiny. One of her requirements concerns the need to take up criticisms and to, to, to respond to objections appropriately. This requirement broadens the Popperian obligation to address anomalies and counter instances. The epistemic spirit of science is distinguished by taking challenges seriously and by trying to cope with them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Another one of Longino's procedural standards is tempered quality of intellectual authority. This community role is supposed to preclude personal or institutional power play. Arguments should be appreciated independently of community hierarchies. And beginning with Merton, all these social approaches tend to emphasize the democratic structure of the scientific community. They portray the community as an open society. In addition to Merton, this applies to Ludwig Fleck, Karl Popper, and also to Longino. They all feature the non-hierarchical structure and the open-mindedness of the, the scientific community, and I skip the details uh, here. Paul appreciates Merton's and Longino's approaches. However, it is not clear to which extent these approaches can illuminate the, the social nature of test and confirmation practices in science. This commitment to the non-hierarchical and open-minded structure of the scientific community may be pure wishful thinking. As to the open-mindedness, I was a bit puzzled. I was a bit puzzled to see Paul ascent to Longino's picture, whereas Kuhn had called into question this open-mindedness a couple of decades ago. Longino speaks of uptake of criticism. I mentioned that, whereas Kuhn argued that, in fact, anomalies and counter-arguments are often ignored. Worse yet, this neglect is to the benefit of science since tenacity is essential for being successful in the end. The non-hierarchical character of the scientific community is likewise doubtful. Empirical surveys have revealed that the scientific community is not a collection of equals. 
it is not the case that all voices are heard to an approximately equal degree. Institutional position is important, and opponents tend to be marginalized and be pushed to the sidelines. The judgment of the leading scientists dominates the community assessment and response. However, such surveys have also shown that parts of this commitment to an open society are, in fact, widely recognized. Ignoring anomalies has its limits, as Kuhn already knew. The salient point is that even the leading researchers are not relieved of the burden of argument. Even scientists at the top of the pecking order need to argue. Their views are not heeded if they simply state how things are to be seen. The benefit of being esteemed by one's colleagues is increased attention. The higher scientists, the scientist has climbed up the ladder of reputation, the sooner his argument is noted and her advice followed. Yet everybody needs to argue, even the mandarins. In addition, even the unambiguous judgment of the authorities cannot force a discipline in a particular direction. Outsiders can overturn a whole field. Daniel Shekman was awarded the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 2011 for the discovery of a crystal structure that had been considered impossible before. His alleged quasi-periodic crystals contradicted the recognized fundamentals of crystallography. Schechtman became an outcast for decades. He was banished from his research group since he was accused of having brought disgrace upon his laboratory. But the scientific process is of such a nature that ridiculed outsider can be right after all. This indicates the correct core of the non-hierarchical or egalitarian nature of the scientific community. However, lots of qualifications need to be appended to the core. Conclusion. So it was my purpose to enrich Powell's scheme by adding, by adding some material to his items number four and five, that is, those items that address how knowledge claims in science are subjected to critical scrutiny. And in my opinion, reconstructing the, the essentials of the scientific enterprise needs additional details of this sort since the epistemic authority of science rests on the credibility of these procedures. Scientific knowledge is first and foremost distinguished by the severe test procedures it has run through and consequently by its enhanced reliability. And the, the reconstruction of the scientific enterprise is in need of a more detailed anatomy of these processes. This is why I think that filling holes that Powell has left open might be of some values after all. Thanks. Yes. Um, I don't know if you, we would like Paul to have the first word in response. <laughs> um, okay, it, I so think my voice is enough for this room, or unless you want it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> is it on? Or well, is it necessary? I don't know what it does. This is on. This is on? Okay. It's nice for the recording, so. Okay, right. 
Thank you. Thanks, Martin, for this talk. And um, uh, thank you for following up, so to speak, my enterprise and critically following it. Um, and um, I have nothing to, to uh, uh, resist any amendments um, and making things more detailed. But I think, and as mostly, and most of you probably don't know that, we are agree mostly in philosophical matters. But there are slight things like little pockets where we disagree. And here's one point of disagreement. And that's the one where you seem to say, now perhaps I'm exaggerating a little, you seem to say when you say science is chiefly characterized by its process of scrutiny, well, the chiefly is very interesting. I mean, what do you mean by chiefly? I mean, this is, a, this is very open. I mean, this is a hedging phrase, and you can put anything in it. So if I put that in terms that you say that um, process of scrutiny is necessary and sufficient, for science, there I really disagree. Because I really think, and you mean by scrutiny here, of course, uh, mostly in the empirical sciences, empirical control. Yes. There I really disagree. It's neither necessary nor it's sufficient. And it's not necessary that you see by the development in string theory. I mean, Professor Lechtenfeld is here. He knows much more about string. Where is he? Uh, or he was he? Yes. So I'm perhaps a little careful here. But the point is, I think it's legitimate what string theory is doing at the moment. The question is the amount, and there is, of course, criticism from inside of physics that people think, well, is it really good that a thousand in the world, a thousand of the most gifted uh, mathematical physicists are doing now string theory, and we could they use them somewhere else as well? This is a sort of psych uh, criticism, soci sociological. But I think, in principle, that's legitimate. And I mean, they all admit that, the next, that, that um, empirical confirmation or disconfirmation is a way, decades, and they've been, and they said it's at least 30 years, and they've been saying that for 30 years. So it's at least 60 years altogether. <laughs> but at any rate, I think this is legitimate. So it's not necessary, not strictly necessary. Mostly, of course, you are right. And mostly I'm saying what makes the difference of science is really this dimension for the defense of knowledge claims. But where I really disagree is that you seem to say uh, if you have this strict uh, empirical control, then the result will be scientific knowledge. And this is just empirically false. I looked in real detail in criminal investigations concerning serial crimes. And I looked into the system, it's called the Vitras system, that was introduced by the uh, Canadian um, police. Uh, and they introduced it, has spread uh, in Europe and other countries. And I looked at the highly systematic character. The problem is this. If you, if you investigate serial crimes, it's extremely important that you find those crimes that were committed uh, by the same man usually, right? Because then you've got the series, and then you can use the empirical evidence of one crime and the other crime and put them together, and then you've got much more chances to identify who it was. So the point is, if you look at that in detail, it's extremely systematic. In the best case, the result is the result that you know uh, these 15 crimes have been done by the same man, and then you have a certain very, very highly confirmed knowledge, but that is not scientific knowledge. So the point is, even using the most sophisticated and systematic procedures in other areas does not result in scientific knowledge. And that was my problem, and therefore I introduced the other dimensions, as, not only therefore, but this is one of the reasons why I used the other dimensions as well, especially the, the connectedness issue, uh, which was the result of my discussions uh, at Cornell, where I got one of the very, really serious blows on my theory. One was in Cornell, the other was in Cambridge, England. Uh, and that led to, the, uh, to, to some of the improvements, especially the uh, epistemic connectedness issue. So what I doubt really is that uh, although we fully agree that uh, defense of knowledge claims is absolutely essential, well, absolutely essential is too strong. It's very, very important, but it's neither necessary nor sufficient. Yeah. I, I can, yeah, I can, yeah. Bond, we have the representative from Cornell next in line, but... <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. But I do quickly respond. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Paul, we, as, as you say, we mostly, we mostly agree. But the point is, as regards string theory, string theory is not yet an accepted part of physical knowledge. I mean, uh, there are different contexts, the context of pursuing a theory and the context of accepting a theory. Pursuing a theory has, has quite different... Uh, quite different rationale, yeah, and uh, and of course you can pursue a theory who is not that is not or that is not yet uh, empirically confirmed, and and the second thing is yes, um, I I I I have a I have a richer account of of empirical scrutiny. It's not just at uh, comparing uh, the results of a theory with experience, but bringing to bear 
certain non-empirical yeah, um, quality criteria, yeah, such as explanatory power. Yeah? So in a sense, I mean, we're becoming very close here because I, I agree with you, but I would frame it a bit differently. I think, think that's part yeah, of, of uh, how, how knowledge claims are, are to be defended. It's not simply empirical. Um, you distinguish certain sorts uh, of agreement with the facts, and this is what distinguishes scientific noise, is a particular report, a, a, a particular account or a particular view on testing uh, and, and examining scientific claims. So it's it's only I mean, it's perhaps hair splitting that we that we need need to do in order to distinguish our accounts. <laughs> okay, I, I have a terminological question that I um, I think gets at something that's presupposed in this discussion. You talk about non-empirical criteria uh, or non non-empirical virtues, but um, and at one point you talked about something in addition to empirical adequacy. But the empirical adequacy of a theory is not something, that's not an observation. What you, what you, could, what you may know observationally is that, it hasn't, is that all of its predictions so far have been correct. But empirical adequacy is always assessed using those values that you're describing as non-empirical. And all those values, this is the Kuhnian point, all those values are themselves theory dependent and subject to revision. So uh, what I'd like to do is just ask what it means to say they're non-empirical. I mean, it looks as though um, when people wanted to uh, evaluate astronomical systems by, among other things, how well they confirmed uh, the uh, corresponded to Aristotelian physics, that's because they thought Aristotelian physics was true, and they thought that because of various empirical successes it seemed to have, and they abandoned that standard when they got a better physics. So I'm not at all sure what, that there are any non-empirical values. I think there are theory-mediated values that are subject to empirical revision, and they underwrite every judgment we ever make about whether a theory is empirically adequate. So I mean to, I want to put on the floor for something for people to think about, what it means to describe some of these values as non-empirical, given how theory-dependent they are and how much they're subject to empirical revision. Uh, this is not a challenge to what you, what you had to say about Paul, but it seems to me that um, it changes the whole dynamic of, of your discussion if you think of these values as uh, disconfirmable, empirical views about uh, what methods are reliable. Well, this, this might apply, Rifle, right, this would be subject to discussion, this might apply uh, to coherence, when you can say, well, this is coherence with theories that are empirically confirmed in themselves, but Look at cases, look at explanatory power. I mean, you, you distinguish between, say, two cases where you have, on the one hand, uh, 17 hypotheses that account for 17 phenomena, and in, on the other hand, you have one hypothesis that accounts for these 17 phenomena. There is nothing in the phenomena itself that distinguishes between two cases. In both cases, uh, by presupposition, uh, you capture you know, the, 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 f the phenomena. But everybody, every si each and every scientist would, of course, prefer uh, the, the first version to the second. This is non empirical by any standard. Second, uh, prediction versus uh, re re retrodiction. Yeah? Um, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you predict a phenomenon, yeah? Then a novel, a novel effect. Then most scientists say, "Hey, this is this is an achievement." Rather than rather than adjusting your theory to these uh, phenomena, but but the result is the same in those cases. You just capture the the phenomenon. So this seems to me obvious uh, to be a non-empirical standard. Well, I would I would have thought that with respect to uh, whether you need seventeen factors or one to explain something. Uh, there are disciplines where, um, si where, where single factor theories, even if they work, are thought to be simplistic and are rejected on empirical grounds, that the, the underlying causal structures are more complicated than that. So uh, I just want to emphasize that it's possible to think of explanatory power uh, as a, a matter of how well something 
tells Again, a causal yeah. story that makes scientific yeah, sense. Yeah, 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 but that's the same thing. I mean, who tells you that a causal story is necessary? I mean, that, that was, the, that was the, uh, the, the gist of the, of the, of the example I skipped, the conventionality of physical geometry. I mean, the, 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 the advocates of the conventionality thesis knew very well that their story violated yeah, the, the cause, causality constraints, but they emphasized that nature doesn't tell you uh, which processes are causal and which are non-causal. So again, a non-empirical requirement. Maybe you can take this question to the break, and we have one more question. <laughs> I uh, think you are not so close in your position to Paul as you would like to have, since Paul has a clearly non-hierarchical position, and you, in this way or another, try to give scrutiny, empirical confirmation, and adequacy a special position in this regard. Right. And I think it is your argument that uh, it's clearly the goal of science is not to um, assemble more and more empirical adequate statements. We want we do want to have cognitive interesting claims confirmed. That's clear. That, but you said, well, the justification then is about the empirical scrutiny. But then look at uh, under determination. Then you came up and said, well, these cognitive values are taken to determine the choice when it is not empirically <coughs> determined. I think even then uh, it is somehow an uh, upside down turn since if it is our goal, where we go for, this is not just an additional criteria to decide in underdetermination, it is what we like to have confirmation for. What we like to have confirmation, I mean, what, what, what kind of knowledge we appreciate. I mean, that, that's the point, that's yeah? Exactly. So, and, and nature doesn't dictate us what kind of knowledge we should be interested in. And this gives us leeway yeah, in, in, dealing, in dealing with nature. Yeah? And this is the, the origin of these, these non-empirical virtues that we demand of our, of our theories. Yeah? We are interested in specific kinds of knowledge and specific kinds of confirmation. Yeah? And, as a, and this, is, this is something we bring to bear on our dealings with, with nature. I think I'm afraid it's time to stop the session at this point. I'm sure there's many more things to talk about later. Let's thank our speaker once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.